The power of the dispenser. Who put the pity and sarcastic smile on the lips of the sphinx, and then on every lips of a statue carved by the chisel of an ancient artist? It is a sarcastic smile at the trivialities of people in the passing events, pitying those whom Satan tempts to buy for himself a moment of fleeting life in the world of eternity. Who built the temples on their lofty, solid pillars and raised the obelisks and the towers and the minarets in our sky, pointing with their fingers to the creator of the earth and the sky? Who taught the world how a person can dispense with this life and its trappings, so he can set aside a remote hermitage for himself in the heart of the desert and there translate all of existence into a deity and a worshipper? He is the Egyptian throughout the ages. This Egyptian is the same one who has begun to confuse me with the paradoxes of his attitudes and behavior. So why did the man whom I saw in the morning stand in front of the one who stood before him, with his arms folded across his chest and his eyes directed toward the ground as if he were before his Lord, performing the obligatory prayer? Do you think he made a mistake and came to ask for forgiveness from his master or did he want a benefit for himself, so he humbled himself in the presence of the one in whose hands the benefits were? I don't know, I was just passing by on the road at that time, but I return home, my blood boiling, and the question began to insist on my mind, until I could barely sit on the chair until I got up, and I could barely get up until I sat down, and as I sat and stood my question was repeated, why is the Egyptian so humbled, humility, and places himself in positions of submission, whether he wants to gain benefit or wants to ward off harm, why, when he knows that he is the man who drew a sarcastic pity smile with his chisel directing it towards the one who is preoccupied with small things, then he is the one who knows the greatness of the creator, so he erected temples for his worship on their lofty, solid pillars, and raised to the heaven the palms of supplication in its obelisks, towers, and minarets, and taught the entire world. How can a person attract all of existence into a hermitage in which there is no presence, except for the deity and his worshiper? I often heard non-Egyptians commenting and questioning about this Egyptian phenomenon, by which those who do not know who Egyptians are deceived, so I used to hear the questioner asking, what is the secret of this submission among Egyptians? He rose up and answered, submissiveness do you see the sweetness and gentleness of a civilized person as submissive? Will the meekness of those who have been refined by religions turn into submission? No sir. Read the features of the Egyptian in his dealings with people. Read them with the depth of history, just as you read the letters of the sky. I mean its planets and stars and their astronomical dimensions. If your eyes see a star the size of a Durham, know that it is your earthly position that is deceiving your eyes, and as for the star on in reality, its size may exceed your entire land many times over. Yes, I say that whenever the situation requires me to say it, not because I am lying or deceiving, but because I know with certainty that this is the Egyptian in his true nature, and that it is the same certainty that makes me ask myself the question, why did the man I saw in the morning stand in front of the one who stood in front of him, placing his palms on his chest in supplication to the one who performs prayers to his Lord and Creator? If I had known that this was the nature and reality of the Egyptian, I would not have asked the question. Should I ask, why does the water flow in the river, the crops grow green in the fields, and man is born and dies? If my memory serves me correctly, it was I Mamali bin Abi Talib, may God honor his face to whom I read this phrase in his book Naj al-Balaga. I read it as a young man memorizes prescribed records, and the book Naj al-Balaga was one of the books that was distributed to the students. I say as a digression that the book Naj al-Balaga by Imam Ali collected its material and entitled it with this title, Al-Sharif al-Radi after Ali by about four centuries, and I return to what I was about to talk about, which is the phrase that I memorized in my early youth from my mamali. And it has become with me as it is the compass for the captain of the ship to guide him to where he is heading, and that guiding phrase is compassed of three sentences, each of which drips wisdom and speaks the truth, and they are as follows. Need whomever you wish and you will be his prisoner, dispense with whomever you wish and you will be his counterpart. And do good to whomever you wish and you will be his prince, or so it is in my memory. Let us now stop at the middle part, because the subject of this conversation that we are having now, dispense with whoever you want to be his counterpart, and I do not want to inflate my image in the eyes of the reader, but rather I tell him the truth of my life and how I lived it, guided by this principle, for only God knows how many rights I have wasted. Whenever I find that obtaining them it requires me to stand before a man whose nature is domineering. What I fear is that life circumstances will force me to take the position of asking someone in need. Because I know how the situation moves me from the status of a colleague to the status of a follower, so I even dispense with my right in order to reserve for myself his equal place. Perhaps there are the closest ties between me and a friend, so if that friend is placed in a position of authority, 
I place his friendship in brackets, and I do not remove them until after that this authority be removed from him. God has blessed me with things that I cannot count, and the greatest of those blessings is that I, by nature, have few desires, and even if I had a desire for something that is inaccessible, it was easier for me to drop it from my account and be self-sufficient, as if the one that had escaped from my hand was a pebble of sand. I am with the Arab poet who penetrated his insight into the truth of the human soul. He said about it that it tends towards desires in a way that increases if its owner pushes it to do so. But also by its nature it is satisfied with a little if its owner agrees to such satisfaction, and the soul is willing if you desire it, with an emphasis on desire, and if you will be satisfied with a little. However, in saying this, I am not calling for asceticism or rough living, rather, the ideal that I see is for a person to have control over himself, such that he knows when to desire and when to dispense, so that desires do not enslave him. This is a combination of striving to achieve goals with all my ability of strength and activity and to dispense at the same time with goals that lead to humiliation of the soul. I say that this combination of the two positions is the highest ideal whenever I see it and it is the same ideal image that sports life achieves for those who live that life as it should be, a football player for example, must make every effort to win. But he is also required to know how to accept defeat without losing an iota of self-confidence. He is like the sensitive scale that we establish in our lives to guide us to take the correct position whenever our desire is fulfilled or not possible. On the other hand, he is the one who avoids us standing in a state like what I saw who I saw this morning, humbly supplicating and humbly, as if he was in the divine presence performing the duties of prayer. Perhaps one of the most distinctive features of the Egyptian personality is its ability to combine its religion and its worldly life. Look at the Egyptian in most of the stages of his history, and you will find him to be the brilliant craftsman, the expert farmer, and the capable architect. All of this is experience and knowledge of the affairs of the world and its materials, but on the other hand, he directs his experience and knowledge towards achieving major goals related to what comes after death. What was in the heart of the architect who erected temples, both ancient and modern, except a feeling that had the nature of worship, that his art was being used in the service of religion? I read the British-American philosopher Whitehead saying that human civilization was founded on three men, the Egyptian with his industry, the Palestinian with his religion, perhaps he is referring to Judaism and Christianity, as we are adding Islam, and the Greek with his philosophy and science. What is important to us in the context of our conversation is the craftsmanship inherent in the Egyptian nature, and the craft referred to includes, of course, the craftsmanship of the artist, from painting, sculpture, and architecture, in addition to other crafts required by wars and daily life. If we searched for a main axis around which this creative energy revolved and targeted it, we would not hesitate to say that it is an axis connected to the afterlife, that is, it is connected to the soul. The ancient Egyptian did not find difficulty in integrating the two aspects into one life, and this is the same thing that we discover in the life of the Egyptian during the Christian stage, which extended for about six centuries, then the Islamic stage after that, as the most important art and industry that the two stages left for us, is related to religious life. Hence, it was impossible to differentiate in the Egyptian's behavior between what is spiritual and what is material. Yes, we say it on our tongues without hesitation, that we are spiritual, while the people of modern civilization from the West are materialists, and then you see us taking this point as justification for us to turn our backs on the thought coming from the West. But I confess to the reader that I very often looked closely. I couldn't help but look at the fundamental difference that distinguishes what we call the spiritual from what we call the material. The people of the West have their religious beliefs, ranging from a Christian majority to Jewish and Islamic minorities. The people of the West have countless charitable societies that help the helpless and the poor. Then the people of the West have arts and literature. They have music and poetry, theater, novels, photography and sculpture. What are all these things if they are not spiritual luminaries? So, could the difference that distinguishes their materialism from our spirituality be science and the devices and machines attached to it? But look closely with me a little and look at the devices and machines you see, such as the radio, the telephone, or the light bulb, and ask yourself. Is this what I see just a mass of materials piled on top of each other? Or is it a building with mind flowing through its parts and connections, which is represented by science on the basis of which it was built? and on which it operates. If that is so, then by what right do we take it as a sign of a material civilization, and do not take it as evidence of a mental or scientific civilization? Science and reason are undoubtedly closer to the spiritual than to the material. However, after I present such matters to myself, whenever I try to find the main difference between spirituality and materialism, I find that I am still faced with an unresolved problem. 
I feel that there is a difference, although I have not come across it, and my last effort in this path is that spirituality is the sign of explaining phenomena, events and events fully or partially with an unseen force, in which a person has no choice but to believe in it, because it is not within the field of science and its methods, as for materialism, it is the one that insists on explaining the actual reality with another actual reality, and then extracts from the correlations its laws that codify that correlation between them mathematically whenever possible. However, if this is the main difference between spirituality and materialism, then it is clear that the two sides do not contradict each other, meaning that a single individual can be both spiritual and material in his life, he is spiritual in the field in which he returns to the power of the unseen, and he is material in the field in which he finds. Sensory reality is sufficient for itself, and it is something that is accomplished by God's will. This may be the same as the meaning of combining religion and the world in one life. At this point, we return to the Egyptian and what distinguished his civilizational stance during the era, and we said that it was characterized by such a combination in a consistent and cohesive organic unity. Except in his periods of weakness, when he lost his ability to create civilizational creativity. So he only had one wing left in his hands fluttering with it. But it does not fly, and on this occasion I say that it came to my attention one day, that Caesar and Christ peace be upon him, both came to Egypt, and their comings were only 50 years or so apart in time. So I could not help but wonder at that time, to myself, wouldn't this in itself remind the Egyptian that God's will wanted Egypt to be a meeting point between the glory of the world and the greatness of religion? If the morals of the Egyptian had attracted this marriage between religion and the world in a living and sincere polarization, we would have always seen him flying with two wings, the wing of worship and the wing of knowledge, work and production, and we would have seen the minaret of the mosque and the chimney of the factory side by side in his life each with his duty and his wisdom. Then we would have found the Egyptian citizen dear to himself in his faith, and by producing it together dispensing with that faith and with that production any situation that would bring him humiliation, then I would not have seen someone like that man whom I saw in the morning standing in the hands of the one who stood before him, with his palms spread out on his chest, humbled and with his eyes directed toward his feet as if he was standing before his lord performing the obligatory prayers. Dot.